All right, so good morning, everybody. We're going to go ahead and start getting started. Um, if you guys can make sure you guys are muted, I would really appreciate it because um, I can't find the mute all button. <laughs> They're all muted. No. They do it right. Be teacher's pet in the front You're going to be teacher's pet. Okay. Um, can everybody see my screen here? Oh, why is this doing Yes. That? Perfect. Okay. So, so again, um, good morning, everyone. My name is Hael. I am one of the uh, junior underwriters here at ICOR Lending um, under our um, underwriting manager, Daryl. Um, today we want to just go ahead and kind of do like a somewhat of a um, not brief but just kind of hit points of the credit report. I've already done this class for our internal operations before and it was a very popular class so we decided to share it with everybody. Um, so in going with the credit re um, report I wanted to just get started on when we're running credit. Um, we are noticing that sometimes things are you know we're human errors, you know, so we want to always want to make sure that, you know, when we're running credit, we are completing um, things properly. Um, you know, name, address, date of birth, social security number. Uh, you know, why is this important? It's important because, you know, we want to make sure we're running the correct credit for the correct person. Um, some of the errors that we do get, um, of course, like I said, we're, you know, we're all human, um, are misspelled names. And that's when you end up getting some DU issues. So, um, you know, that's why I put this on here, you know, more than anything for us to make sure that when we are running credit, we're making sure we're spelling the names and, you know, last names correctly, um, that we are placing our date of births on there. We do see a lot of missing date of births. So we really do need those on there because it does become a post-closing issue. So again, you know, this was just more of like a little informative. So I'm going to go ahead and dive in to our, um, our uh, credit report review. So some important points to focus on will be uh, collections and charge-offs, uh, disputes, bankruptcy, modification and forbearance, uh, any deferred payments like student loans and installments. So to get started on collections. So um, as we all know, you know, there's different guidelines that are, you know, Fannie, Freddie, FHA with, um, how do I, so with, I'm um, sorry about that. I was trying to hide something. With FHA, you know, the majority of us already know that, you know, the guideline does read that we do have to hit uh, the, uh, the DTI with a 5% uh, collection, anything that is above $2,000. Now that does mean, um, you know, cumulative. So let's say your borrower has, you know, 10 collections and they don't, they add up to $1,800. In reality, we don't have to hit them with them because FHA requires anything above $2,000. Now, as you can see here, I have a file that has 3,865. I am gonna have to hit this borrower with that collection at 5%. Um, Fannie and Freddie, uh, you wanna look at your DU and LP to see what um, instruction is given on your findings um, because uh, sometimes they don't require you to hit them with a payment. So, um, you know, you definitely want to take a look at that uh, so that you can be able to guide yourself on regards to those findings. But FHA, you know, across the board is always going to be 5% above $2,000. So $2,000 and above, 5% hit. Um, when it comes to collections, anything that's medical or charge-offs, um, Anything that's a, a medical and non-mortgage charge off you, it does not affect your uh, you know, DTI or ability to obtain a mortgage. However, it is going to definitely affect your borrower's FICO scores. Um, now, you know, with DU and LP, you definitely want to double check as well with these um, because they may require them to be paid or to have a proof of zero balance or some type of payment agreement. I have seen it happen. It's not common, but it, they, it may come across, you know, for you to have to have some type of proof of that. So um, a lot of the times I have borrowers that tell me, well, it's just a medical collection. It doesn't affect me. Yes, it, and it does affect your FICO score. So if it's a small collection like this particular borrower, 
it was 192 balance, you know, it, it's good to, you know, instruct them, hey, you want to hire FICO? You got to settle those. But I mean, it's obviously up to them. Um, disputes. Um, this is something that a lot of us tend to kind of skip over. Um, this is extremely important, extremely important. Um, here we have a actual uh, file that we had in, on hand that had a consumer dispute. Now, DU did call out for us to actually um, either hit the bar with the payment or address the dispute. So you want to make sure you're not skipping through these. With FHA, you must remove disputes. With con you know conventional, um, you definitely want to check your um, your DU and LP findings. In this particular instance, it it was it was it was big. It was a big issue, even though it was only seventy nine dollars. It had to be removed. The dispute had to be removed from all credit agencies. So therefore, you know you have to now rerun credit or an LQI to be able to see what the standing of this is. So disputes are huge. You know, it's not something that, oh, it's just $79. It's a collection or a charge off. I'm going to ignore. This particular one was a charge off with a $79 balance and it had to be removed out of dispute. So always make sure you're reviewing your DU and LP findings because it's extremely important because this can cause a file to be non-purchasable. So this is why this is important, uh, um, you know, so, you know, just make sure you guys are reading your DU um, and LP. And I did not put a copy of the DU uh, on this one, but it was on the DU that it had to be removed, the dispute, even though it's a charge off. Um, bankruptcies, um, you know, always make sure you know what type of bankruptcy is uh, showing up. In this case, there was a chapter seven bankruptcy um, when you are running your DURLP, we had a case not too long ago, I would say about, you know, four or five months ago, where it did not have a discharge date um, on the credit report. It didn't actually have a discharge date at all. It was a discharge, discharged file, um, filing, I'm sorry. But unfortunately, the DU would not, did not, just did not like the file, the file at all, because for some reason, the credit report was not reporting a discharge date. So always make sure you do have a discharge date, and that's going to be under here, under your, um, um, your public record information. So it'll give you your filing date here and your discharge date. When counting your years, you always have to go always, always, always off of your discharge date or your dismiss date. So not the filing date. Um, again, make sure there is a date there. Make sure it does state discharged or dismissed because at the end of the day, if even if it's discharged or dismissed and it's not reporting, your DU or LP will not go through. It will it will decline the the um it will give you an ineligible, even if it's two years or four years. Um, we did have a case where, you know, we had the, 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 the four years um, not too long ago and conventional did not like it at all. So, you know, we had to try to go FHA and only FHA liked it. So even if it's past the four years, you got to also let your borrowers know that even if the discharge date is four years, you know, it's gone past four years, DU might, you know, might not like it. So in our scenario, DU and LP did not like it. And the only way we could have, you know, moved forward with the file was with FHA. Um, modifications and forbearance. Um, it's been a while since I've actually seen one read forbearance, so I couldn't put a, a copy on here, but it will kind of read stating um, something like this, loan modified by not under federal government plan. Um, so with these, we are going to need a full copy of the modification or forbearance agreement. Uh, the forbearance agreement does look pretty much like a modification. It can be like a new note, note and agreement. I've seen them. Um, so with these, uh, it must show current after the modification. So they can't have any late after the modification has been finalized. Um, and, and so the last delinquency must be prior to the loan modification. Of course, once you receive your loan modification, you also want to verify how the, prop, the, the 
the modification was done, um, you know, what type of plan they got. I, I had a, a file years ago, um, I would say maybe three years ago, where the borrower um, was put in a modification and were not aware that they had to share equity. So when we got the payoff, our payoff was almost $90,000 more than they expected. And they were not aware that they had to share equity with the, modif the way they signed their modification. So that's why modification paperwork is extremely important. You want to know what type of modification they got into, what the terms are. Um, deferred payments. Uh, so you can see uh, the most common on deferred payments are student loans. Here are two types that you kind of see more common, which would be the Fed loan service or the Navient. Um, so, you know, we, we took a look at the loan letters and, you know, the lending letters with FHA and Fannie are at 1%. So a lot of the times we are seeing, um, you know, the calculations come in because everybody did see, you know, the change in the half a percent, but the loan letters will tell you that there has been a change. Um, so, you know, we can go with the payment that's on your installment. If there is a zero installment amount, it has to be a 1% for Fannie or Freddie or a half a percent, I'm sorry, Fannie or FHA or a half a percent for um, Freddie. So I did go ahead and put the guideline here so you guys can take a look at that. Um, and it does let you know you can get the fully amortized payment letter. I have done that before where the fully amortized payment letter was less. So it was better for me to hit him, you know, with that payment to be able to, um, you know, have a lower DTI and qualify them for more. Um, but you do have to hit him with a payment on these. So I have seen them sometimes that they come across with no payment, or like I said, with a half percent payment when it should be 1% and it kills your DTI. So just make sure you guys are taking a look at that and always, you know, take a look at your guidelines and, you know, or you can ask us and we can help you out. But at this point, Fannie and, um, and FHA is 1% and Freddie is half. Um, installments, this is a good one. Um, I thought it'd be good to share. Um, installments under 10 payments can be excluded. So as you guys can see here, the sample is it's an auto loan. Now just make sure it does not say auto loan lease because even if your um, in, uh, in amount looks like it's less than 10 payments, leases cannot be excluded. So it will only be installments um, that are uh, not leases that are less than 10 payments. In this scenario here, you do see that it's a little bit over the 10 payments, but our reporting date was March and not April. So therefore we knew that they had already made a payment. This does state 50 um, payments left, but we are able to calculate here and, re and put our months. So this is how on your 1003, you, would, you don't have to click this exclusion button. Um, I left it on here just so you guys can see, but you only have to put here on your debt factor under this um, amount, um, a credit installment, you put the number of installments to include will be 10 months left, you can change this to nine and this balance will be updated by your LQI, which will show that your payments are less than 10 payments left and it'll, you know, it helps your, um, your DTI a lot. So let's say, you know, this is 530 bucks. It's a lot of money, but they have less than 10 payments. So it's not going to be something that's going to continue. Now, this cannot be done with revolving credit. The difference between revolving and installment is Installment is usually a set amount that you're borrowing that you're paying off. A revolving is it's continuous, you know, like, a, you know, a credit card or a store card that people, you know, like Victoria's Secret or Express, you know, you guys like to go shop. So that's going to revolve. Um, now, you do always want to always, always, always refer back to your LP and DU findings, no matter what, because that's also going to guide you um, to be able to make sure that you're doing the right thing. Um, at the end of the day, again, if you guys have any questions, you know, we're here to help. Um, so that, those are the major ones that, you know, we wanted to bring up, you know, to everybody's attention. Um, but there are other little items that we did want to know. Um, inquiries, addresses, alerts and validations and consumer statements. Um, we you, you know, do notice that, you know, some of us like, you know, don't, don't quite see why we're asking for this. And um, here with the inquiries, the reason for that is, as we can see here, they have a community 
community capital credit card that was pulled. So sometimes what ends up happening is, you know, they pull a credit card like here we have Discover and it's not reporting on your credit just yet because they probably just pulled it. So therefore it's going to show up on your LQI. So what you want to make sure is that you're creating LOEs for these and you're going to note the purpose of the credit was pulled and if there was any new loans or any new credit obtained. You want to verify your trades when you're looking at all your trades. Make sure there's um, the, the new inquiry is carrying a balance or not carrying a balance. If you don't see that new inquiry on that trade, you want to make sure you ask your borrower if there is a balance on that credit card. You know, because again, if your DTI is at that max and they did pull a credit card and do have a balance, then this is, um, you know, of course, going to uh, affect your DTI. So this is why this is important, you know, because borrowers, um, you know, they say buyers are liars, right? <laughs> you know, you want to make sure that they're telling you the full story because at the end of the day, everything comes to light. So addresses. I had a situation not too long ago where, and it was my own client. She did not tell me she owned a manufactured home. It's important that we look at these addresses and create LOEs and make sure they clarify the ownership interest in the, the addresses, whether it's I don't have ownership interest or I do. Run a property profile. Um, I did that and she did not tell me she owned the manufactured home. And it messed up my DTI. So it's important that we're looking at these addresses and creating LOEs. We are verifying the previous two addresses because a lot of times when they are owners, the address do show up under ownership and it will say, you know, that they own it. Um, I didn't put a sample on that one here, but, you know, it will a lot of the time say that. But it's important that we are looking at that because, again, this is going to affect your DTI. <sighs> Um, consumer um, statements and alert validations. Um, here we had a case where a borrower had, um, you know, was a victim of fraud and they had placed a fraud alert. So a lot of the, the times these will um, kind of like block off, you know, certain creditors to run credit. So we need to make sure that they're removing that fraud alert for the moment that we run it and they can place it back. Um, you know, we do want an LOE on this. We do want to know what happened um, what was done to for it to be, you know, to for it to be prevented and what was the outcome, we might need additional information. I had a file where um, we had a borrower who was a victim of identity theft. She filed a police report, you know, they found the, the, the person. Um, and, you know, so they provided us the police report. And why? Because a lot of the, you know, she had a couple credit cards that were pulled in her name that were not hers. So, um, you know, we're able to try to help these borrowers having that information to be able to document, you know, what's theirs, what's not, and, you know, all that good stuff. Um, so, you know, these are, these are definitely important to take a look at um, and not skip over. Um, so that's pretty much it. Um, if you guys have any questions, I did go ahead and add this little glossary here. Um, I do get asked a lot of the times what is like the A mean, the I, B, C, G, J, M. Um, I didn't know one time, you know, what the S was, you know, because when you're running um, credit and you're seeing these, it's good to know um, what uh, your ECOA code is, especially if you're trying to exclude any payments that are being paid by third parties. Um, so these, these are important because again, going back to DU and LP, you want to make sure you can actually exclude them if they're joint accounts or S accounts, you know, co-makers. Um, so, um, you know, and looking at your guidelines, but I thought this was a great little tool that we could, you guys can refer to if you don't know what your ECOA reads. Um, for instance, let's see here. See these here have these and it's, it'll be right here. I don't know if you guys see the mouse. <laughs> um, here, like if you notice, this is a joint mortgage. Um, you know, we've had instances where we want to exclude mortgages because they're being paid by third parties. Well, this is a joint mortgage. So this allows for you to prove that a third party is paying for that. It is not, if it's not joint, you cannot exclude it. But you also want to make sure you look at your DU and LP findings for that. Um, that's all I had. <laughs> Question. Oh, yeah. 
So further, you're mentioning the 5% pass to 2000, yes. right, for the collections. So let's say somebody has $2,100 in collections. Are we hitting them for 5% of the full 2100? Yes. Or just, okay. Yes, so Not it'll always be, um, so I don't know if you guys heard the question. Um, so the question was, if the collection was 2100, do we hit them with the 5% of the 2100? Yes. So um, I'm sorry, guys, I'm trying to find the, the little thingy majiggy to see if you guys have any questions. Um, so yes, we are going to definitely hit him with the 5% of 2100, um, you know, because at, at that point it has exceeded that, that, um, that uh, 2000 mark. So you, you you would hit him with that. Mm -hmm. And then um, for removing disputes, right? What's the the <laughs> for, for removing disputes, what's the turnaround time of like, if someone calls in, removes the disputes, how long until that's going to reflect on their credit report where we can repool credit to see that the disputes have been taken off so that really does depend on the creditor um like uh it, it can take 15 to 30 days it, it, it depends on the creditor um I, we had the one that we were dealing with i think it took 30 days so it, it just really depends okay um and you do have to rerun credit mm -hmm. Um, once, once that, because we must see that the credit report has is showing that the dispute is lifted. Anybody else have any questions? When you are in escrow, though, you could order a resource to remove the disputes, but you would have to pay for that. Okay. Yeah. So um, what Karina mentioned is when we are in escrow, if you guys are of course short on time, you can um, request a um, a rescore. Um, but you do have to pay for that. So, of course, if it's showing up on three credit bureaus, then you're going to have to remove it from all three credit bureaus. So just, you know, you know, keep in mind that you are going to have to pay for all three credit bureaus. What's the cost on um, What was the cost? It's about, I believe, $45, 45? Okay. per account. Mm -hmm. Per credit, yeah. So the cost, um, uh, uh, the question was, what's the cost? Um, it is uh, forty-five dollars per account per bureau. So if you've got five collections and it's three of uh, three credit bureaus, you know you're gonna gonna multiply the forty-five times fifteen, pretty much. Six hundred dollars. Yeah, yeah, and sometimes it is less than paying off the collection. I can't. Are you even sure yes. that? Yes. Yes, we're definitely going to share this with everybody. Um, you know, if you guys do have any questions, I'm sorry, I don't see a little pop up. So if you want to unmute, I'm trying to look for the pop up, but it's just not coming up. And then what? So you're mentioning for the loan modifications? You reached your limit. Ah, for, the, for the loan modifications, right? For both refinancing options, what are the turnaround? It's three months for a cash out. The, how many payments they need to make after the loan? Term? So, um, with FHA, it does require for you to do cash out at twelve months payments for um, rate and term. Um, I believe conventional and FHA are three months, so they must be current for three months. What if they had a modification and they sold that property and want to buy another? Um, they might, we might, ask, I mean, I don't think I've ever asked for a modification paperwork for the sale of a property that's already been sold, because in reality, it's not affecting um, your purchase, you know, because you've already sold the property. Yeah. Any questions? You guys have any questions on, on um, what are we on Zoom? How to make sure. No? No. <laughs> Not everybody at once. <laughs> oh, yeah. Great job. <laughs> well, um, thank you everyone for attending. I mean, if you do have any questions that come up after, um, you guys can, uh, I, I, again, I can't find a little thingy majiggy to message so my email is jy munoz at icorlending.com i'm happy to answer any questions that might come up um you can call the office and ask for me um and uh i won't share my cell phone right now because i want you guys blowing me up 
<laughs> um, but you know, I will, I, I will give you my cell phone if you guys want to like shoot me a text or an email. Again, my email, jymunoz at icorelending.com. But if you guys have um, no questions, I mean, that was pretty much my little short presentation for the day. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> Aquí estaba. Ay, no, pero I wanted to see. Here's a chat. Why didn't it pop up before? Yeah. Hey, no question. No, I, th I think it's like 42. I don't really know exactly. No, I thought it was 42.50, but I'm not sure. Bye, everybody. Thank you.